Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron'sAudioCorner.com and I'm going to quickly walk you guys through my test setup for ground plane measurements, which I use for subwoofer testing and also loudspeaker testing to get my outdoor reference for when I want to move the testing to indoors and have a room correction curve applied to those indoor measurements. As you can see over here are some subwoofers that I've recently completed testing on. And I'm going to walk back down my driveway a bit. So have fun with me. It's uh, I'm in North Alabama and it's pretty hot and some bad weather's about to move in here. So it's quite humid. I'm sweating like crazy. Alright. So you can see a subwoofer that I've set up recently. I uh, just set them up maybe in, I don't know, 30 minutes ago. And I completed testing on this a couple days ago. But what I wanted to show you was just the general idea of where I'm testing from the space between my neighbor property and my property uh, the distance from that location of the subwoofer to either house is about 50 feet uh, give or take and the reflection time reflection free time from the emanating drive unit subwoofer loudspeaker whatever to the reflecting source and back to the microphone is about 70 milliseconds uh, which is plenty adequate for the low teens in response being reflection free so for subwoofer for testing it's perfect for loudspeaker testing it's perfect now uh, generally i test out here but when when it's really hot if i were going to try to test today i would definitely not be doing this outside because you can see that it's definitely exposed to the sunlight and it's crazy crazy hot and it doesn't cool off until later in the afternoon so if I were going to test today, I would actually test in my backyard. And the backyard is surrounded by a fence. The fence is about 40 to 45 feet away from uh, the center point of my, my testing, which is shown here by the piece of plywood. That's normally where I would put the subwoofer right in the center of my backyard. And from that location, it is also another 40 to 45 feet to the house itself. So again, plenty of distance for reflection free. I think the time delay between reflection point to the, uh, or from the speaker under test to the reflection point back to the microphone is around 60 to 65 milliseconds. So plenty of time to be reflection free. And yeah. So that's it. That's the gist of where I'm testing. And I conduct all my measurements outdoors for my reference, my ground plane, and then when I want to move indoors for my loudspeaker testing, I just go into the garage. And the good thing about the garage is it's insulated, uh, so it's you know not heated and cooled, but it doesn't take much to get it heated and cooled. And then this is the garage area. So once I have an outdoor reference, I can simply move into the garage. I can use Clipple's ISC module to create a room correction curve and I can apply that room correction curve to any of my measurements and then I can conduct any of my testing indoors. I just prefer to do my subwoofer testing outdoors because it makes life a little bit easier. It's just one less step that I have to go through. But if the weather were bad or something along those lines, then absolutely I would do the testing outdoors to get my free field measurement. And then I would bring it indoors and apply my reference curve or my room correction curve and then do my testing indoors. And if you're curious about the room correction, Yes, it absolutely does work. I have proven it to myself numerous times and I have no qualms about using room correction to uh, generate adequate data or accurate data, I should say. But yeah, that's it. So now you've kind of got a feel for where I'm testing from. Uh, I guess one thing I should note is it is generally quiet out here. I live on a cul-de-sac. It's out kind of in the country. Uh, houses are sparse. The only time that I really have to deal with any noise is in the late afternoon when people are, you know, traffic's picking up from people coming home from work on the on the main road which is up the ways a little bit and you can get a little bit of noise from the big trucks you know the, the redneck trucks around here and then also in the summertime and in the fall we have our people or our neighbors that are mowing so but for the most part the noise is really really low out here and I'm, I'm good there I'll just have to deal with the heat and that's it so thanks for watching this portion and let's get to the data now that I've given you an example of how things are set up in my yard for the subwoofer testing and for general free field testing, I'm going to give you a demonstration of how I actually test a subwoofer. And I want to make it clear that what I'm about to show you isn't how I generally conduct tests. Again, normally they're conducted further out in the yard, far away from any reflecting surfaces. But 
the weather is uh, hot and humid here and I don't want to stand out in the sunlight and I don't want to pull all the gear out into the yard to test right now. So I've just set it up near my garage and I'm going to do some screen grabs. I'm going to do some actual testing and kind of give you an idea of the stimulus that's used to test the subwoofers and then you'll maybe have a better feel for what the test consists of and maybe appreciate it a little bit more. So here we go. All right. In this example, the microphone is about a meter away. Generally, it's two meters away. And the subwoofer is right here. And the port is on the back. Something worth noting is that generally when you test a subwoofer, you will try to place the source of sound uh, kind of in between the two radiating areas. So what I mean is it's got a port here. It's got a front woofer here. And generally what you would want to do is you would want to make the microphone in the middle of those two areas. But just for the purpose of this test, I'm going to place the subwoofer here so you can actually see the cone move. And right now, I'm going to show you. You can hear each of those individual tones. So we're starting with 40 hertz now. As those tones are played, the microphone is picking up the fundamental tone of 40 hertz and then it's picking up harmonics. Now 40 hertz just fell, so now it's moving on to 63 hertz. But it's picking up the harmonics, and these red lines indicate a threshold for the harmonics. So when it fills that threshold, that's when that's set to the maximum SPL that it can take undistorted, and the software will continue on to the next tone. And in this case, I'm talking all the way through this, so the tones are going to be disrupted, so I'm going to hush for a second. And you can see the third order harmonic is starting to creep up, getting a little bit higher and higher. Now what I found in this particular subwoofer's case is that it can take a lot of input voltage and it never increases above a certain amount because the amplifier is limiting the input voltage or basically limiting the output. So in this case you can see that I'm running at 110 dB all the way up and it's continuously going up, basically meaning that it's limiting. There's no more, there's no more input voltage uh, being passed on to the speaker. The amplifier is basically saying, ah, that's too much, I'm cutting it off because it doesn't want to feed the subwoofer too much power. And it's going to go until I hit the maximum one volt RMS that I've set here, and then it will continue on to 80 hertz. So right now it says I've hit 110 10 dB and now I'm moving on to 80 hertz. You can see 80 hertz right there is carrying on. Now I've got my neighbors doing lawn work across the street, so now the measurement's going to be skewed. But I wouldn't typically take any measurements when there's any kind of external noise like that anyway. But it is interesting to note that the actual measurements themselves are mostly impervious, at least on the higher order um, distortions, to any external noise. And it's going to keep going. I'm probably going to top out at one volt RMS. Yeah, it looks like it's just going to keep hanging around at 111 or so. And then it's go on, going to go to 100 hertz. It's interesting to note that the second order harmonic of 100 hertz failed. And now 125 hertz, second order harmonic failed. Now I'm doing 160. There it is. So the last measurement was at 160 hertz and it fell at 0.25 volts input. And if we go to the table here, it shows 0.25 volts is red. So it would have taken this 103 
as the highest peak SPL without failure. And then I would go into my table results. And these are the measurements where I have value. So there's some other things in here that I won't get into. For example, this 100 hertz, it didn't have a single one to pass. Now, this measurement, I'm against the wall. I've got all sorts of external noise. I've got the microphone placed at a distance that it normally isn't placed at. Don't pay attention to these numbers. Again, this was for demonstration only to show you guys what the test consists of and how it is performed and how it works and how you get the numbers that you get in the end. I hope that explains everything pretty well. If you have any questions, ask, but there's a demonstration on how you conduct the CEA 2010 test using Clipple software. Pretty simple and straightforward, as long as you do it when there's no noise and as long as you do it from a far away reflective surface, all is good. I could have adjusted this camera, but I didn't want to. So I'm gonna go with this. We'll talk to y'all later. Peace out. What's up everyone, this is Aaron. Uh-oh, I gotta sneeze. Sneezy time. <coughs> Woo, all right.